Max Baharich, welcome, man. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. You're always here, man. You were almost born here. That's it. How old are you now? Um, 20 this year. I turned 20 in September. 20 this year. I reckon you're the youngest guest by the factor of half. <laughs> you know? So it's it's awesome to have some some youth on the show. But I wanted to start, man. Give us your bar pitch. You know, pretty girl in the bar. And she says, who the fuck is Max Baharic? Well, um, not to beat around the bush, I'm pretty much a cowboy. I've just come back from the country. I've been chasing cows. I've been... Uh, riding horses and riding motorbikes and working cattle and understanding how to be cattle pretty much, you know. Um, it was a big journey for me, but I've, lo- I've, I've fallen in love with it. Yeah. Um, I think the, the simplicity and the, and the beauty and just being out in the open doors and the environments really sort of swept me un- under my feet. Mm. Um, I'm back recharging the batteries and then I'll actually be going away again in March. I you, love it that much. You're going back, so we'll we'll come to that because you you're a, you're a city slicker. Like you, you grew up, born Longerville, mm. bunch of your life down in Bondi. You know now Queens Park. Like it's a very different life from the private school of you went to Scots, yeah, yeah, yep. Scots College to the Jackarooing in Outback Australia. Let's start. Did you like boarding school? You didn't go to boarding school. You were a day boy, yeah, day boy, yeah. Do you enjoy Scots? I did. Um, Scots was a phenomenal school, but school wasn't the right place for me. Like I never sort of uh, went hard in sports or went hard academically. I sort of went backwards. I was a bit of a naughty boy in school, but I was just uh, immature and and didn't really take uh, the bull by the horns, I guess you could say, until (laughs) now that I'm a lot older and I can look back on that. and A lot older at 20. A lot older, yeah, exactly. I don't think you can say that yet, man. (laughs) Uh, Why do you think though, like it's, you've obviously got genetic talent, you've obviously mm. got intelligence. Was it a rebellious thing that you didn't embrace sport and academia at school or it just wasn't your thing? I, I mean, now it's my thing. Like now I'm a lot more active and I do a lot more reading and stuff like that. I just think honestly my brain wasn't ready when I was in school and now that I've had so much time with me and my brain, I mean, all I've got is my brain when I'm on a horse for six hours. Mm. I've had a lot to reflect and I've had a lot to sort of um, think about. And now that I look back on school, I actually wish I could do school again and mm. and sort of try play first and get the best academics I could. But, I mean, it is what it is and I, I'm the person I am yeah. f- for the way that I carried through school. And yeah. And yeah. Yeah. You can go back if you yeah, want. Yeah, exactly. You know? I'm not sure your mum and dad are going to pay for it, but <laughs> you can go back. Tell me though, we're talking on a podcast called Meat. It's yeah. not exclusively about me, but lots of people that are on here listening to the show are in the industry, hospitality, suppliers, doctors, blah, blah, blah. You were raised in a family that has five generations of butchers you know your granddad's names on this building here and on our retail stores your dad's the co-founder and ceo did you feel pressure to come into the business or the industry or was it more of an inspiration or was it a deterrent i'm super curious about as you were going through school whether potentially you didn't have to study because you always had a good opportunity here um, or whether, you know, I know you love animals and vet and things with, mm. with stuff you thought about, but I'm really curious about what went on in your mind before and what's going on in your mind now. Um, it was a little bit of all of that. Like um, I always knew that I had a successful family business behind me and I've always had a f- passion for food and meat and animals, like you said. Um I don't know. To be honest, like I just really love food and mm. I love animals and going away to the country has really put everything into place and put it, everything into perspective. And mm. I mean, that's why I'm going back is because I love it so much and I want to learn and I want to be the best. You know, my father's a cultivator and he's a he's an innovator and he's a pusher of boundaries and I want to be like him but better. And it's, it's a big thing to say and it's big shoes to fill. But, mm. you know, deep down I know I can do it and I've had a lot of time to sort of think and and, and work out the person that I am and I know I can do it. Um, do what though? Uh, I 
to be honest with you, like I just want to take I want to take the meat industry to the next place. Like, yeah, my dad's already done that, and and twenty five years ago when he started Vix Meat, it, there wasn't there wasn't really a market for high quality um, product, and he's really hit that nail on the head. And now it's time for me to sort of carve my own path in this industry. Yeah, whether that be pastoral, whether that be wholesale, whether it be everything f- like full integration, I'll, I'll have to sort of. Um, uh, find that, but mm. right now I'm just yeah living my life like I'm young and like you said mm. I'm, I'm only twenty like I'm just finding my own fit you know what I mean and mm, absolutely how do you reconcile the vet v butcher because some <laughs> people would say they're diametrically opposed yeah hundred percent have you ever thought about it um well yeah when I was younger and I was in school I was doing chemistry I I, I loved chemistry and that's what I w- wanted to do as a profession was to go to veterinary mm. school and 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 fix them and help them, mm. but um, it's a, it's a I don't know I I don't really want to fix them. I want to eat them. I guess. Yeah. But no, nah, I, I I don't know. It's I I I still don't know. Honestly, sure. Like tomorrow, I could wake up and I could be. You know what? Maybe I don't want to go to the country now. I want to start learning. I want to start studying. I want to do this and that. Yeah. And I sort of take I sort of seize the days as it comes. But I've got such an amazing opportunity behind me with this family business with my dad with my grandfather and my auntie like the th- three biggest role models in my life I mean I see what they're doing how hard they work and the success they've had and yeah. the sacrifice that they've done and and it's um, motivational it's inspiration you know that's what mm. I want to do I want to wake up and work hard and and appreciate what I've got and and sort of step back and look at and what I've got you know what I mean like mm. I, you were saying though, and you better mention your mum as a role model, or of you'd be course, in all yeah, sorts no, of trouble, my by mom. the way. You know, <laughs> Jesus. Man. Um, but you mentioned before we came on, you were saying you, you you're back from nine months or so. Yeah, just keep that close to your mouth, Max. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like your voice is loud, but don't worry too much. Um, how long were you away? Nine months. Yeah, so I left April first, and I got back December tenth. And so. the when you're out there and we will talk more about it that you felt at home and being back here in the city where everything becomes you know ostensibly superficial again that you feel more at home in the country like how do you again reconcile perhaps working in the family business that's you know always going to be for the vast majority at least of it in 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 the metropolitan city versus a potential career that allows you to live in the country yeah, that's a great question and, you know, I, I never know. I could – well, my my goal is to go to the country for four or five years and sort of do every little facet and aspect of the country. So um, do a year of bull catching and uh, helicopter flying and earth moving and literally just take the whole pastoral um, sector and learn it from like the back of my hand. Mm. And who knows, in those four or five years I might go, I actually love this too much to give it up and that's what a lot of people do. They go away to the country – coming from the city or coming from a different lifestyle and they see how beautiful and simple it is and they just mm. fall in love with it. Mm. Um, you know, the people up there, they they work so hard and they don't care if they've got, you know, the newest piece of clothing or the nicest car or the nicest watch. For them, it's just being in the, in the outdoors and not having mm. to worry about um, all the bullshit that's in the city. They just wake up, they work hard. Yeah. You know, they chase their cattle and then they go to sleep and they do it all again and they're happy doing that. And that's Do you think that it's a it's a really interesting point you raise that they're happy doing it because the suicide rate amongst farmers is super high. And having been out there for a year, I'm super curious in you know, maybe you're too young to, with no disrespect, no, no, to, to to see the the signals that perhaps it isn't as happy as everyone that watches the biggest little farm or one of these, you know, super cool um, but slightly romantic documentaries about city people going to the country. But mm. it must be lonely out there. It must be very different from a world of living in Bondi and getting up and going to the beach, going to the gym, going to the pub, lots of pretty girls around. Mm. Do you think there is a pure happiness with all of them or do you think with a lot of people out there it's just the life they've they've been born into? Uh, that's a really good question and I didn't actually know that there was a high suicide rate among farmers. But 
when Super I was super high. So thankful for farming, um, thankful for farmers, which is a, a not for profit. Like we we should give those guys a plug because here one of the big things they're focused on is the the challenges. You know, particularly with droughts mm. and isolation and and hardships and things. So yeah, it's a it's a real and present danger. No, yeah, it's and it's a shame to hear that because when I was up there, I was at my happiness, and. It's very different for me because I've come from the city and I've never had anything to do with being in the country. So mm. I can see why some people that are born into that and doing that day in, day out, it can get a bit mundane and it can um, get 365 a bit tedious a year, for them. Man. Exactly, yeah, There's 365. No, There's three no months sleep. off to come back to Bondi and recuperate. Exactly right. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, for me, I, I was just part of one big family up there. So I, I never felt alone. I never felt mm. um, by myself. You know, obviously I had homesickness and I missed my parents and my baby sister and my brother and my sister and all my friends and stuff like that. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I was part of another family and, and they were there to work hard, get the job done. And, and that's what, you know, I had to accept. Like I, the first month was very hard for me, you know, a lot of nights I sort of cried myself to sleep. What am I doing up here? Like why, yeah. why am I doing this? I could be doing so much more with my life, this, mm. that, but... I mean, ultimately, I was up there with reason and with purpose, and I said, "You know what? Let's mm. let's do this." And I did it, and it's been the biggest and best year of my life. And I'd say it's going to be the biggest and best year for the rest of my life because mm. it's just it's really been a catalyst for my brain to sort of mature and then just start thinking. And I, I nonstop am I thinking about you know mm. um, political, global, all sort of issues, whether it's um, the smallest or the biggest. Like mm. my brain just has to k- keep doing something and. I think I've learned that through being up there because you've always got to be doing something. That's my phone. Like I tell you to turn your phone off. Can you believe it? That's unbelievable. <laughs> anyway, continue, man. Um, what? You, sorry, man. You you were saying it was the what I could have been doing more with my life, which you know, at nineteen years of age when you went up there is probably mm. a little bit hard on yourself. Mm. What do you think you would have been doing if you didn't go bush last year? I don't know. Well, I didn't really do a whole lot the year after I finished school. Like I worked in a bar for a bit and worked at um, Vix Me Market for a bit and went to Europe for a couple of months and it was sort of like a gap year. Not that I deserved a gap year because I did nothing in school. So you weren't solving, you know, world peace or Exactly anything. right. And I don't think I would have done much uh, last year as well. I probably maybe would have um, started my butcher's trade. Actually, actually, you know what I would have done before? If I didn't go to the country, I probably would have started my butcher's trade and probably would have started or would have started. Would have started actually because yeah. there there wasn't really there's many roads for me to take, but I'm you know I want to work in the business and I want to be my father's son and and sort of fill in with his shoes. So yeah, I would have done my butcher's trade and mm. um gone from there. You know whether that's study abroad and go then to uni to do business or do a trade in business or or whatever whatever that may be. Yeah, I'd say that would have been my um would have been what I've done, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Are you appreciative of, and that's a probably not the right word, but grateful for I suppose the roadmap that your dad's not laid out for you but proposed for you where you do go and spend some time jackarooing, where you do get a chance perhaps to go and work for Polyface Farms, where you do get a chance to work in the business, where you do get a chance to work at a – a slaughterhouse mm. or, or or the like as opposed to like the vast majority of people that just ha- typically have to figure life out through trial and tribulation which for some of us can take 30 odd years like do you do you think about the fact that you actually do have a roadmap that your dad's put down for you yeah 100 percent. and i've only got one person to thank and that is my father you know like before I went away, I was a very different person. I was, my head wasn't in the right spot. I was just getting up to mischief, you know, not working, not learning, not bettering myself. And he sort of said, look, you, you need to pull your head out of the clouds and you need to start getting on with your life. You know, school's finished and you've had your year to do whatever it is that you did. Now mm-hmm. it's time to sort of um, start putting the bricks in place. And he sort of said, you know, um, I've come up with this five-year plan and I went to his office and me and him had a big talk and he was like, if you want to do this, you know, you have to do this 110%. There's no more um, sorry, there's no more this, that. Like you're mm. nearly 20 now, you're no longer a teenager, you need to start moving on with life. And I said, you know what, Dad, I'm ready for it. Um, yeah. And I did it and and I'm so happy that I did do it because it's it pretty much 
I went there a boy and I got stripped down and rebuilt into a man. That's the way that I see it, you know. Yeah. I had to learn how to problem solve and if it didn't work, I had to do it this way or do it that way or just get it done. Mm. Um, working with my hands, working with my brain, working with everything, you know what I mean? And I was very lazy before I went and now I'm proactive and I was uh, I didn't use my brain a lot and now I'm always constantly thinking and mm. there's only there really is only one person to thank and that is my dad. I, I mean, I knew about the pastoral um, industry and I knew about, um, farmers and, and jackaroos and ringers and stuff like that. But I would have never thought when I was in year 12 that I'd be up there doing that and surviving mm. and thriving. And, and yeah, it, it's only down to one person. That is my dad. And obviously my mum as well, like my mum and dad together. But, mm. yeah, my dad's five-year plan that he came up for me has changed a lot. And now that I can um, sort of work on my own five-year plan, it's, yeah. it's been drafted many, many times. But, but yeah, 100%. I'm, I'm very grateful and very appreciative for the father that I have. Good. What was your typical day up there? Um, if I broke it down into a week, uh, Monday we'd wake up and we'd, we'd muster cattle. So we'd wake up at five, saddle our horse beforehand or make sure the um, bikes were oiled and fueled up and ready to go. We'd mostly have, on a horse or mostly on a bike? Mix and match. Like yeah. some musters you'll, have, you'll be on a horse, some musters you'll be on a motorbike depending on the terrain. Sometimes if it's downs country, you want... Someone who's a bit handier on a motorbike that can sort of zip across the downs, no problem. And yeah. Um, so yeah, we'd must we'd saddle before Brecky, and Brecky was usually five thirty. So wake up at five and saddle your horse. Uh, have Brecky at five thirty. Pack your smoker and lunch, and you'd load your horse up on the truck, or you'd load your motorbike on the um, tilly, and then you'd be off. You'd be out on, into the paddock. Um, there'd be a helicopter flying around, sort of surveying where all the cows are, and you'd be sent out if you're on a motorbike to go bring them in. And you'd block up in a central point at water so cows had access to water and they had a place to sit down and block up. And once that paddock was in and in one big mob, um, you'd walk them to the closest set of yards and process them. So mustering takes a whole day. You get it. You get out there depending how far it is. I mean, we have 360,000 acres there, so there's a lot of country to travel to. You might have to drive out 40K or drive out 80K or it might be somewhere central, like 10K. Right. Or on, on, on your own? Or on your you, own. Yeah, oh, yeah, you, you oh. wouldn't be riding side by side with someone? No, so you'd be in your truck on the horse yeah. and you'd drive out 80K and, and then there'd be you wouldn't walk any more than 20K on horseback because it, it's just too, too much for the cows, the cow. too hot too, for yeah, the, horses the horses as well yeah. and um, for the motorbikes as well, for all machinery. It's so hot out there you can cook your machines. and yeah, wow. I mean, you can cook yourself as well. That's the most important thing is water and... Mm. And stuff like that. So, yeah, you'd block up and then you'd walk to the closest set of yards and that'd be your first day. Let's say that's Monday. Uh, well, what time would you finish in the afternoon? Depending on the walk. So, cattle usually walk about 3, 4K an hour um, and your walks would be anywhere from 8K to I think the biggest ones that we did was 37K. So, you could yard them up at about 1, 2 o'clock. It also depends how quickly it takes for the cows to come in mm. and some could be all on one side of the paddock and some could be here. So you have to do two, two different mobs and, I mean, there was so much to it and I, I couldn't believe the science behind it, to be honest with you. Like I would have just thought, you know, you sort of rock up and you get the cows in and this, that, but the, the amount of time and the amount of blood, sweat and tears that go behind it was was so amazing and and just learning how to actually work cows and learning how to ride a horse and a motorbike and mm. and 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 all of it was just I couldn't believe it honestly like it, it was it was so amazing and so yeah you'd get them in about five six o'clock at night or two or three in the afternoon depending how far you walked and then that would be that'd be over you'd you'd go back to the station wash your horses down give them food and service your motorbikes clean them up make sure they're good for the next day and then the day after mustering is is processing and yard work. You're missing details, man. I want to hear it all. What happens after you clean the horses and put stuff away? What do you do? You go and chill out, have a beer? So, yeah, go to the rec club. We had a rec club, a big fridge that had beers and all sorts of drinks and we had chips there and um, sort of bathroom and so all the basic necessities. How many of you? Uh, there was At the start, there was 13 of us, including our two managers who were on the outstation at, at McAllister Station. Yeah. Um, so McAllister Station was an outstation to the main station. Mm -hmm. There were 60K away. Yeah, so 13 of you at the start. How many at the finish? Uh, right at the end, there was four of us. So What happened to the rest? They, they finished or they dropped out? Um, so two, two people got let go. Um, so the leading hand and his uh, girlfriend got let go. What, and just, then, just didn't work hard enough or? No, they um, they're just he was a bit of a tough man. He was a very hard worker and he knew what to do, but he was very tough. 
So there's a lot of HR um, problems. I had a lot of problems with him. You know, he couldn't, me and him didn't see eye to eye because I was from the city and he was from the country. And yeah, um, he just, he was a very hard man to work for. How old was he? He was very young. And I think that was the biggest downfall of him. Is y- younger than you? He was 21 and yeah. he was the leading hand. So he'd yeah, been, really? he was only his third year and he was getting put a lot of responsibility on him and yeah. he, he sort of cracked and he, it, the power got to him. Yeah. Um, any he, fights? Any fights? Not between me and him. There were a couple. There, really? there, I knew a couple Good nearly ones. broke out. Um, he was a very big man. So <laughs> was he? Everyone uh, stayed away from everyone him. Everyone stayed away from old Shano. But no, he was a good bloke. He, uh, I could see where he came but from. But he got and, fired. But he got fired. Yeah. So he and his misses, girlfriend too. Yeah. So she was a bit of a nutcase as well. Really? Everyone had a run in with her. No one really liked her. Um, yeah. No, she was a proper nutcase. So you'd, you'd hang out in the rec club, have a few beers, play pool or something? Yeah, pool, we had a pool table pool and table, a ping pong table there. Ping pong table and then dinner and then bed. That was the simplicity of your so life. So, yeah, pretty much wake up at 5, knock off at 5, a couple beers till about 6, 6.30, yeah. have a shower, dinner at 7 and then in bed by 8.39. And after dinner, you know, you might watch a movie with a couple of the boys or go play some pool, have some more beers or have a couple of rum and cokes and then <laughs> go to bed and do it all again the next day. Yeah. And were you reading stuff? Were you like, were you, were you doing any learning other than on the job stuff? Um, I was doing a bit of drawing and I was doing a bit of like lyric. I used to write down lyrics before I went to bed because I did a bit of freestyling because you have so much time up there. Like you honestly yeah. pick up every little hobby you do. So I did a bit of drawing in my book and yeah. a bit of freestyling style and lyric writing but I didn't do much reading which is which I'm going to definitely embody this year do it bring a lot more books up bring a lot more podcasts up yeah nice bring a lot more documentaries up because you have so much time and yeah and yeah the biggest changes talk about you physically how have you changed so the biggest changes in you in me yeah um from the nine months up there uh physically I think the biggest one for me you know I lost (laughs) <laughs> I was a little bit of a fatso before I went up there because I just came back from Europe and I was in Europe for uh, three months just drinking wine and eating for three months straight. So I think I went from like 77 kilos to 94 kilos. So I was a big bopper. Yeah, wow. And then, so you uh, went from 94 down to 77. Right now I think I weigh 78. So yeah. I lost it all. And then you got to factor in that I put a lot more muscle on and yeah. really toned myself. And now I'm going to the gym and doing a lot more um, sports and stuff like that to build on that foundation I have. Yeah, you look good, man. So, <laughs> thank you. You look pretty good as well, yeah, sure. For an old bloke, for sure. <laughs> so physically stronger, like you must be stronger, yeah? Yeah, no, a lot stronger. I mean, yeah. lifting 60 kilo cradles and, and scruffing 100 kilo animals, 150 kilo animals and being able to lift a 150 kilo motorbike, like big things. Um, Any injuries? Yeah, I, I actually did. I've, I've done my knee really badly. So Really? I, what, what, falling off? or So on a motorbike, I was chasing after a bull that had broken out of the herd. He was, yeah. he was playing up and I was sitting along the downs trying to grab his tail to flip him over so that he, While you he, were got, riding yeah, still. So that yeah. he got winded and I could tie his back legs and get him in, back into the mob. And I didn't see a log that was hiding in tall grass and mm. my front wheels hit it. And I put my whole leg out to sort of catch myself so I didn't go um, mm. bundy up and I hyperextended my whole leg. Ugh. And I went to the um, I went to the physio after Chrissy early Jan and I said, look, I've done my knee badly because it sort of clicks out and I don't know when it would click out. But so it, you it had feels to keep like work, you kept working. Yeah, kept working, had a day off and then went to the hospital. He said, you've just badly sprained it. Yeah. But I went actually to the physio early Jan and he said, I've either torn my meniscus, torn my ACL, I've got like three mil of liquid floating around in there. There's some cartilage floating around. He, uh, he said that uh, it's a miracle that your knee healed because your ACL can heal um, incorrectly mm. and it's just worse if that happens. The power of use, man. And that's it, yeah. You probably need to get it fixed though, especially yeah. if you're going to have a life as a farmer. Yeah, definitely. You know, because it's, it's interesting. I remember we went up to a couple of years ago up to one of the Rangers Valley farms and... Oh, what's his name? Um, one of the former Wallabies. I'll think of it in a minute. But you know, because of all these days, he played second row for the for the Wallabies, and you know, he's he's, he's one of the farmers up there at Armadale for that feeds the Rangers Valley um, feedlot, and and oh, he's he's crippled. Like he gets on and off the the back of a ute like a, a ninety year old man. Mm. You know, because he, I suppose he didn't think about the implications of his injuries when he was young, doing what he loved and how he makes a living later in life. Being a cowboy or yeah. a jackaroo is the exact same. I mean, yep. the amount of physical 
strain and stress you put on your body um working out out in the farm is just is immense like mm. when you by the time you get to your 30s and your 35s your whole body's just written off from um horse riding motorbike the amount of crashes you have the stacks you have i mean if you do bull riding and bronc riding you get you a were limp doing in your that, leg you? yeah i was yeah i was doing a bit of bull riding and i love it i love bull riding but yeah. you, you see old cowboys with their big buckles that they've won from PBR got a cowboy limp. They have to limp everywhere because their legs just have given up on them. They've put that much physical stress on them that they just can't handle it. And yeah, I mean something's got to go give way sometime, and mm. might be their knee or their ankle, or could be anything. It could even be their quad or ACL, and it's just gone. Mm. Do you think about that? Like as you intend to go back this year, do you intend to to keep ball riding? Yeah, definitely. Um, that's why I'm going to the gym. I want to get stronger so I can compete mm. professionally in bull riding and because I just love it. There's something about being on a bull <laughs> and bucking it out and just sort of it's me versus him, you know what I mean? There's nothing like it. Dangerous sport, but it just once you got the rum and cokes into you and your heart's going, man, there's nothing better. <laughs> I'm not going to comment on that, brother. <laughs> I'm really not going to comment. <laughs> Just continuing on with what you got out of it, did it give you, and you've kind of alluded to it anyway, clarity about what your values are in life and and maybe not specifically because you've already said that you, you do want to be in the industry, but what you want to do more broadly speaking with your life? Yeah, 100%. Um, going away and being exposed to that has definitely um reassured me i guess you could say that meat and pastoral is going to be my future and it's going to be my career mm. um even though it's incredibly hard and getting harder 100 percent. i mean going away there and learning what hard work is is the mo- is probably the biggest um thing for me like if someone's working harder than me i've got to be working twice as hard as them and if it's mm. getting harder and harder and harder for me that's what i love i, I love working under pressure i love working fast i have to be like I said, my brain's constantly going at a million miles an hour. It has to be doing something. It has to be work and it can't, I can't have a downtime. Otherwise, you know, I go insane, I guess you could say. Like, What about when you're back here? Like what have you done since you came back during your break? Um, not a whole lot. So I worked in the factory up until Christmas and that was, that was flat out and I loved that. I loved yeah. every single aspect of that. Um, I didn't find it challenging. What I found challenging was um, sort of the time frame in which you worked, but the work in its own was was rewarding it you're always constantly doing something i was pretty much a patty master down there yeah so so i was just doing patties for seven eight hours a day and i loved it just flat out like a lizard yeah but how do you reconcile again that you you don't like downtime but you you're quite comfortable doing not much when you're back here in sydney like do you think the environment of being here where you've got way more autonomy as opposed to when you're up on the ranch and there's a real structure around mm. your life that that perhaps the the structure is a better place for you. Yeah, you know? 100%. Like I suppose if you had a full-time job here, you you you'd, you'd also have that kind of structure, but I'm just wondering whether you've thought that through. No, 100%. Um coming back here, I sort of went off the rails a bit like I've started, I spent all my money, you know, getting Uber Eats and going out on the beers and stuff like that because you didn't have those luxuries. I mean, mm. the closest town was 110k away. You didn't have um, a pub to spend money at or Gucci to spend money at or Maccas to spend money at. So now I've actually set up a new routine for myself and I'm going to the gym and I'm starting to build a structure, I guess you could say, that I can stay in so I don't go off the rails and go out every single night on, and get on the on the piss and stuff like that. Yeah. Because um, you're exactly right. If uh, All I did was pretty much work, eat and then sleep and I love that. I loved every single bit of that. Mm. I was saving money. I was um, getting physically fit, mentally strong, every single every single part of it. Was, yeah. was for the uh, win-win. Yeah. What about socially? You know, you hang out with the guys obviously, but what about romantic and, and those kinds of things? Do you feel like you miss out if you're up there or? No, not at all. I know so, you had a little girlfriend at one point. <laughs> no, nah, not at all. I um, Not at all you didn't have a girlfriend or not at all you didn't miss it? No, no, not at all did you miss it because you yeah. have rodeos every now and then. and There were um, some cowgirls there. Yeah, 100% there were some cowgirls there. <laughs> Uh, you'd, so you'd work for two, three weeks at a time and then go to your rodeo. and Did that pitch you gave at the front, is that where you honed that? Because that was a pretty good one. Which one? The one I said, what's your bar pitch? And you went, I'm a cowboy. Yeah, yeah that's, what, that's my opening line in the city. 
<laughs> the girls love a bit of country, <laughs> hey? Oh, they would. <laughs> Show them all your tattoos. Yeah, and... that's it. Uh, well, I just tell them that I'm a bull rider and they go head over heels. <laughs> Those Bondi girls, they didn't know what they're in for. <laughs> if only they knew you lived in Queen's Park. Yeah, that's the funniest yeah. part. They asked where I live expecting. Do you, get, do you get your mum to drop you around the corner? <laughs> uh, uh, just tell her out the front here so they can see the nice Mercedes and then get out and act yeah. like a high roller. Nice. I want to talk a little bit more broadly, mm. philosophically about, and this is as much about your view as your generation's view on, on life because I don't know, I... I I'm 51 years of age and, you know, I had, like you, had a really blessed upbringing, great education, good schools, good opportunity and, you know, but I would, and I was chatting to your dad about this um, earlier today, that you always sit there, whether you're 31, 41, 51, 91 and, and you think if I had to go back and do it all again, it's exhausting to think about it because you do get punches in the face, mm. literally, figuratively and, and otherwise. And I'm just wondering whether you look at the world through this lens of rainbows and butterflies or are you more realistic around what lies ahead and, and, and how are you preparing yourself for that? Um. Answer the first one first, Maxie. Like, how do you look at it, man? Are you truly optimistic about the world? In terms of... Just in general, in man. In general, yeah, Are 100%. you optimistic? I mean, um, as simple as saying, is a glass half full or half empty? Like, I always say, it's half full, man. Like, I want to I wanna run at life 110%. Like, a lot of people... It's just hard for me because, I, because I've been put in such a harsh, extreme environment and I've had time to really reflect on what life is and... I mean, life at the end of the day is pretty shit unless you make it good. Like you, you, money is the center of it. I mean, not for everybody, but at the end of the day, money really is the center for everything. You need money to buy food and, and buy shelter and have good times and this, that. But, mm -hmm. um, but there's, there's, there's many millionaires, billionaires that not only are miserable, but take their own lives. Yeah, so. exactly, exactly right. And that's when it comes down to happiness. So that's, that's, that's really what I've learned. That's the biggest, biggest thing for me up there. Before I went away, you know, I wanted to have a Ferrari. I wanted to have a, a Rolex. I wanted to have all the high, um, expensive things and, and live mm. a high life and stuff like that. But it's no longer like that, you know. Mm. Um, Can I ask, I, did you get that from your friends at Scott's or just from growing up in the eastern suburbs? Where do you think that I, came from? Um, I think a little bit of everything. I mean, uh, everybody, you know, wants to have look the best and dress the best and have a nice car and have a nice house and stuff Not like that. Not everybody, man. I, 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 I would disagree with that. I think some people, some people do and I think the society we live in particularly, you know, where social media mm. and Instagram lives are- 100%. Present a, a world that is so divorced from actually how people live that people do think that's the barometer of success and- you know, I suppose that's where I'm leading to with this. Yeah, is no, hundred percent. At the ripe old age of of twenty, how do you balance that 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 romantic, successful view of young bucks sitting on Ferraris versus the reality of you know what truly does make happiness? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like it, it's all nice and dandy to open up your garage and hop in your Lamborghini and go to your nice job and being nice clothes and stuff like that. But exactly like you said, there's plenty of millionaires and billionaires that have so much money that they don't know what to do with but live such a miserable and unhappy life because, uh, I mean, I don't know what, why it is for them, but for me, because I was, it was just I, I loved having a simple lifestyle. Like I've come mm. from such a chaotic and frantic life in the city with, you know, my dad having such a big, beautiful, successful business and meeting so many people in my life and I've always mm. been surrounded by um, money and 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 coming from a good family and having a, all my friends have come from good families and and come from wealth and stuff like that, and to go away to the middle of nowhere where people don't make a lot of money, they just like I said before, they they love what they do. They wake up in the morning and it, to them it's not it's not a job, it's not work, it's it's life. That's that's what mm -hmm. they want. And I mean, I didn't know that there was a big suicide rate amongst farmers and I'm very I'm very sad to hear that and I can understand why because it it, it is really hard up there it, mm. it it really is like you don't have um a shop down the road or or this that you're you're in the middle of nowhere and it's it's up mm. to you ultimately it's up to you if you've got a problem you got to fix it you got to hit the nail on the head you can't call up 
um, Jim's mowing or you can't call up uh, whoever, it, it, you got to do it. Mm. And that's what I loved, I think, because I've always had um, a phone and reception and this, that. I've, I've been able to call up or, or ask for help or sort of live like a, a cruisy lifestyle. But then I got put out there where if I had a problem, I had to solve it, I had to tackle mm. it. Did you see any of your, your, your work colleagues up there that – either talked about or exhibited signs of depression or anxiety. No, not at all. And that's no. why that's why I was quite interesting. Yeah, that's why I was quite surprised by what it. What about back here? Do you have any of your friends that are have suffered from depression or any friends that 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 have tried to or taken their own life? Yeah, no, I I have had a couple um friends that have gone through depression and um it's it I I mean I at one stage had depression. I mean I remember when I was in year twelve going through school and like I said I wasn't um excelling in sports or I wasn't working hard in academics and I was going mm-hmm. backwards and backwards and I was like, I mean what How did you know you had depression? You just felt just, it or you got diagnosed? I, I yeah, I was never diagnosed, but I just I didn't really see a point to anything anymore. I was like, you know, th- this sucks. I don't want to go to school. I don't want to work. I don't want to yeah. do this. I don't want to do that. Like this this sucks, man. I don't want to wake up and go mm. to a boring job and make money and then go to bed and do it all over again. Like I don't want to go to school. I don't want to do this. I just want to I don't really want to do anything to be honest. I was over life and like mm. I was only what 16, 17 at the time, so pretty pretty funny mm. but probably, yeah probably the furthest thing from funny but yeah, yeah 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 um what what did you do did you talk to anyone about it like did you feel like because i'm super curious yeah, about because yeah. it's a real issue Max. yeah 100 like, percent. it's a massive issue that if you with your natural happy personality and the awesome family that you have surrounding you and all the opportunities feel that it's hard to find meaning in life, then there must be some people, a lot of people out there that are truly struggling with it. And, and I'm curious as how you got yourself out of that that hole. Well, I mean, I think the biggest thing for men's personal health is this, there's just such a bravado that men are meant to be strong. You know, they're meant to be look strong, be physically strong. They're not meant to cry. They're not meant to show emotion. They're just meant to carry on and bring home the bacon. Mm. And for me, I've never been like that. Like if... I've never been afraid to cry if um, a pet's passed away or if someone's passed away or if something bad's happened to me or if I've done something wrong or mm. or I've never been afraid to approach mum or approach dad. And I did go see a psychiatrist for school because I was never good at school and, I, and I've never been afraid to sort of just put my heart on a sleeve, you know what I mean? And mm. sometimes it's burnt me and sometimes I've I've gotten back tenfold. Yeah, and and it's a shame that you know there is that bravado that men are just meant to be men. You know, they're meant to hide their feelings, yeah. meant to hide their emotions. They're meant to be strong. They're meant to be big. They're meant to be bold. It's it's bullshit. Like if you if you've got something on your heart, you need to you need to let it out. You can't just bottle it out, bottle it up, because that's what's going to slowly kill you. Mm. And and I found that out through first hand experience. Like whenever I ha- I used to bottle up all my emotion and bottle up what. Um, everything that I was thinking, everything that I was feeling until it until it imploded on me. And, mm. and that was in the first month that I was up there. I, I had an emotional breakdown. I, you know, I, I just kept waking up like like it was nothing, going to work, being happy, being this. Like I love this. Um, I, I love chasing cows. Yeah. Um, and I kept bottling it up and bottling it up and it would have been three weeks into me being up there. I just had a massive emotional breakdown. What, I did, that, what did that look like? I just I woke up for work and then I just lost it. I was saddling my horse and I went back into my room and I cried. I was packing my bags and I was like, I'm done with this. I can't really I can't do it. Like I I'm just not strong enough. And Shane, um, the leading hand came in and I had a yarn with him and he sort of said, you know, like, if this is what you want to do, this is what you want to do, like pack your bags and go. There's nothing I can say. Um and then I sort of had you know, so I caught up mum, caught up dad and and um And what was their advice? Just, just stay up there. Like you're up. My dad, the, my dad just said he he didn't say many things. He said, you know, you're up there with reason. You're up there with purpose. Just do it. And mm. then that's that's when I was like, you know what? I am up here with reason and purpose. Yeah. And then, and I stuck it out, and I'm so glad that I did because I love it. Like, did you have any recurrence of it? Um, no. Uh, from from that day, you know, I got a bit sour towards the end of the year when it was really really hot, sort of. 45 degrees and 97% humidity and there, mm. there wasn't much to do. It was dry. There was just doing shit jobs, like getting tidy up jobs and stuff like that. Yeah. 
And um, I, was, I was getting a bit sour. I, I didn't want to stay there for much longer. I wanted to go home. Home time was soon. I knew home time was soon. I just wanted yeah. to go home, back to the city, see all my friends and stuff like that. And I got sour for two, three weeks and then sort of talked to everybody. I was like, I'm sorry for being sour. Like, this isn't me. I, sh- I shouldn't be cracking the shits over no reason. And mm. that's and then it clicked again for me. I was up there with, with, with reason, with purpose, bettering myself, learning and mm. st- stayed that extra month and and, and loved it. Yeah. I, I just love it. Like I just love everything that has to do with being up there. Yeah, which is awesome. Do you find yourself comparing yourself to some of your friends that have working, doing a trade? Probably not many out of Scots. Probably only ever been one person out of Scots that went into a trade, but doing university, people that are doing medicine, people that are doing law, people that are doing vet. Mm. Are you comparing yourself at all to them? Is there any... I'm loving what I'm doing. Is there any, I wish I was doing what they're doing? Um, no, not at all. It's actually the opposite. I'm telling my friends, come chase cows with me, like mm. leave uni behind, come come up to the country for a year or put uni on break and go up there because the way I see it, I think everybody, regardless if they've got something to do with the pastoral industry or not or if they're going to have something to do with it or not, should go up there for a month or a week or even a week and even a day. I mean, if you're going to travel up there only for a day, like you should mm. at least stay for a couple of days. But yeah. see what it is and see what that industry is. I mean, everybody's so happy and so easy to go to Woolies or um, go to Victor Churchill and buy a piece of steak, but mm. not know where that what that beast has been through and yeah. and and how that beast has been worked from from a calf up until being in the feedlot and then going to the slaughterhouse. Like, see what what. It truly is up there. Mm. Um, is it just cattle country up there or is there crops too? Uh, I think there's a bit of crops on, on the way to Cairns, but it's mainly cattle country. Yeah, it's country just up arid there. land otherwise. Yeah, 100%. Just yeah, yeah. red rock and, and black soil. Yeah, which is a perfect segue into I want your view. And again, this is Max Baharit's view, but also the collective view of your peers around this whole veganism plant-based movement like how do you how do you see it what do you think is driving it do you think people are are really researching and making um balanced decisions based on facts and science or do you think it's a a really good marketing by the the (laughs) plant-based industry um well, it's a very touchy subject when it comes to like vegans and veganism and and even vegetarians. I guess the way I see it, I don't have any problem if you're a, if you're a vegan or if you're a vegetarian or if you're a, if you do paleo or pescatarian or or whatever it is that you is. But as soon as you start preaching that and pushing that on people and turning up to butcher shops and turning up to factories with signs saying meat is murder, this that, like mm. it's just wrong, man. Um, Why do you way, think it's wrong? It's wrong because. I don't know if people are, um, choose uh, being a vegan because of animal welfare or that if or they don't like beef or they don't like um, chicken or, or whatever it may be. If it is because of animal welfare, like it's just it, it shouldn't be what bases your um, diet because the way that uh, when I was up there, the way that we do it, we put cows first mm. because at the end of the day, cows have a pretty shitty lifestyle. They're born into captivity and they're, purely raised just just for their, what they yield, just for their beef. Mm. And we know that and that's why we're putting every single foot in in front of ourselves to put cows first. Like we don't, our, we're scheduled to knock off at five, but that doesn't mean as soon as five o'clock comes, we knock off, go have a beer, yada, yada, yada. We're in the yards, we're in the um, out in the paddocks until the job is done and until the cows are put first, until they're on water, until they have food, until they're happy mm. and they're not stressed out. Because like I said, they have a very, very shitty life and- mm. And we're not, you know, whipping them and forcing them up the race and and punching them and purposely um, dehorning them and and branding them and giving them earmarks and and trying to scare them into because we're natural predators and and we know that scare them into doing this or doing that like it, it it's not it's not how it is up there. We're putting cows first. Yes, like yeah. we're we're yeah. It, what are they fed? Are they all just eating pasture? All, up there? all on pasture. Hundred yeah. percent pasture. And they're um. We give like we give them molasses and we give them um, lick and we give yeah. them supplements so that they're yeah. healthy and they're and it's a, it's it's a double double like we're only, we're only doing that so that they're fatter and they have more meat and they have more this and they have more that I mean yeah but at the same time I mean they're they're healthier they're yeah. um better mentally physically yeah 
Um, the reason I ask is because, you know, what you said before about everyone should, whether it's a day or a year or, or however long um, in between those two, go and spend some time up there because I do think that people – city folk in particular are so dislocated from the reality of food in general 100%. that they assume that because they've watched documentaries or Disneyland or whatever it happens to be, they know to eat a cow, it's got to die, mm. but they don't or they refuse to acknowledge 100%. that to eat crops that many, many animals also die, but it's easier to ignore them because they're small and that that dislocation allows them to have this romantic view on what is good for the planet, what is good for animals, and ultimately what's good for themselves. And I do think somehow we need to get people more in tune with Mother Nature again and, and, and see firsthand. I don't think people need to see an abattoir firsthand mm. because I think for, for most people That's that pretty intense, it's, yeah. it's pretty intense as much as it's probably, you know, again, it's the cycle of life. Yeah, for 100%. anything to live, something has to die and, and for people to truly understand that, I think that would make more rational decisions that are ultimately better for them, the animals and the planet. But back to your peers and Guys and girls, have you got many friends that are, are, are choosing a more, whether it's exclusively being a vegan or um, a, a plant-based diet predominantly? Are, are you seeing that trend? No, I don't actually know many. None of my friends and none of my people that I'm like, closely associated with are vegans or vegetarians. Mm, maybe that's because you've got a drumstick on your arm. <laughs> <Yeah>. and, uh, <laughs> they're scared of it. <laughs> Because there is a big movement. Yeah, 100%. I can, yeah, well, I didn't know there was a big movement. But like I said, I think people need to get educated first before they start jumping on their keyboard behind their screen saying, you know, yada, yada, this, you're not treating animals, you're not doing this, you're not doing that. And when it comes to the campaigns and they're showing videos of mistreatment of animals and stuff like that, it's exactly like the news. They only want you, they only want you to see what they want you to see, see you know what course. I mean? Like, yeah, it's the same as research. Exactly yeah. right. Like On both sides of the ledger, both the omnivore side and the, the vegan side, yeah, 100%. everyone chooses footage or... 100%. Science that, that, that backs their argument, which is why I think we need more balanced human beings of people that are out there doing it and explaining it as it is. Mm. Does something die? Unfortunately, it has to die. If you want to live, something has to die. I mean, the funny thing is like people are so quickly to advocate about animal misuse and mistreatment and stuff like that. But, and I there's mean, a lot of that though. There Max, is there yeah? is a lot of that. But mm. I mean, the bigger thing for me, like what hurts me the most is, I mean, they don't even look out for their own fellow mankind. I mean, look at all the, the poverty and all the war and all the problems that's going on in our day and age and in our world and in our in, in our mm. um nation of people, mm. that's that's more important. I mean, you've got people in Africa and you've got people in war-torn countries and stuff like that, but they're so quick to say, mm. um, oh, you should be a vegan or you should be this or, or whether it, whatever it is. Mm. Like there's bigger there's bigger and um, better problems that we need to face as, as a community um, first, you know what I mean? Mm. Like, No, I agree. I agree. And I was actually going to, so you, you, you're really good with this segue stuff at the moment, <laughs> man. Thank you. I was going to ask you how do you see some of the big issues. And I'm going to throw a couple at you and, and you just go down whatever rabbit hole you want. Yep. Let's talk about probably the most divisive figure in the world at the moment, Donald Trump. How do you view as a leader, as a man, what he is doing? And this isn't a political question, but but through the eyes of a 20-year-old, how do you view Donald Trump? I mean, I don't know much about Donald Trump and I don't, mm. it, I don't think much about it um, day in and day out. I might see something on the news that he's yeah. uh, sent a missile out or he's done this or he's done that. And, I mean, pretty silly. Like, I don't know why you need to be causing more problems and sort of pushing that line. But, mm. you know, you do you and I'll do me. Yeah. What about some of the those big problems that you talked about before, the war in Iraq? you know, poverty and things, do you as a 20-year-old think that you need to do something about that? Yeah, 100% we do. I mean, yeah. 
that there's so many millionaires and billionaires and, and even trillionaires nowadays that there's so much money that can go around to fix all these problems. Mm. But, I mean, then power and greed get into the equation and people just want to be more powerful and the richer get richer and the poor get poorer. I mean, I remember reading something in economics in year 12 that 18% of um, – the Asian population are billionaires. Mm. Well, there's more billionaires in Asia than there are millionaires in Australia. Like, yeah, there's so much disposable income and there's so much money in the world to be fixing these problems. And it just, it's funny. Like, I don't know why they aren't getting, like, why they aren't getting solved. I mean, like I said, power and greed and money and all that. But I mean, like, because money's generated or or billionaires are generated through consumption. Yeah. That's it. And the more we consume, the bigger the problems become. Like this is this is the the the, the fundamental problem we have as a human race in my eyes mm. is that we all want to be successful, we all want to travel, we all want to drive nice cars, whatever it happens to be, but all of those things, you know, even farming, all farming, mm. not just animal farming, but all farming from one end of the spectrum that potentially does good to the other end of the spectrum, the industrialized farming that does an enormous amount of bad, but all of it ultimately has us on this train that's, you know, uh, a, a really massive, serious problem for mankind. And yeah, we're sitting here years. in Australia at the mercifully tail end of the worst fires we've ever seen. The, the drought continues and yet other than a lot of anger and a lot of political talk and things. I don't think many people are making changes to their own life. No, they're not. That are going to fix that problem. But I think your generation are, are starting to make some of those choices. And here's an example, and, and I'm curious about your views on this, that there was a documentary that came out, I think it was in 2014, called The True Cost, which was about the fast fashion industry, Zara, H&M, all of those things that, again, your generation were the primary consumers of. Mm. Buy clothes for Friday night, throw them out on Saturday because they're so cheap without understanding the entire food chain of that, the human cost, the environmental cost. Everyone sat there going, it's never going to change. And we come five years later and because, again, driven by your generation in a really positive way that the secondhand clothing industry in the US is now bigger than the fast um, fashion industry. That's amazing. $38.5 billion industry. And I just, I'm curious about you as a potential future farmer. Do you think that we can get to that point with agriculture and food where we go from like super dire when you look at it, that it really does feel like a problem that's, not impossible because there are people doing incredible things, but a monumental problem that per perhaps even in your lifetime you can't fix. But but how do you view that, Max? No, hundred percent, and that's that's what I want um, our generation to head in is is a completely traceable, ethical, morally, um, environmentally traceable. Um, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, that's all right. It doesn't matter. I, I think people know where you're going. That, yeah, yeah. That the whole food chain, the food trust from paddock to plate, people understand. Exactly. It's it's clean. I mean, like from when that when that calf is, is born to when that calf ends up on that plate, that it's fully traceable. It's it's fully clean, mm. environmentally, ethically, morally, um, economically. Everything is just traceable. You know what I mean? You can see it through. Mm. There's no dodginess here there's no gray areas here it's just how it's meant to be done and how it's meant to be done truly mm. and i mean like uh, this shirt i got secondhand from a vintage store there you go and it's funny because i think we're actually as a generation starting to make that a thing like it's mm. trendy to wear clothes from the 90s and from from the early 2000s and it's trendy to buy older clothes and mm. clothes that are already been worn and um baggy jeans baggy jeans 100 percent 100 percent <laughs> what do you think is the biggest cause of climate change? Uh, that because of the natural resources that we consume, like industrialized countries, Australia, America, Europe, etc., six times the amount of natural resources we have 
produced we consume every year that will be the fastest species to ever extinct ourselves mm. and when humans are gone the world will go back to a natural equilibrium in a in a relatively short period of time and then he compares it to the importance of ants to the environment that if ants were to become extinct then the entire environment would become unsustainable and you know 20 odd years later you look at it and you start to think Perhaps there's merit in what he's saying. 100%. But then there are other people that, you know, I've had the good fortune of talking to all the Joel Salatins and Tammy Jones and, and Charlie Arnott's and things that are doing some really amazing things with sustainable farming and Luke Winder and that they're showing that the yields that they get from their farm are greater than the, the intensive farms and that if we can get people willing to pay more because they see food not just as a consumable but as medicine and they understand that you're going to be 51 in 30 years' time and that if you put in good fuel now, then you'll be healthy in 51 years' time, whereas the person that makes bad choices now because they go, well, it's too expensive to eat good food, but they get to 51 and they've got diabetes or they have a heart attack or they have a stroke, then the cost to society and to them is far more than they if they had invested that money earlier in life. But um, I get the challenge of getting people to, to actually think that way of pay the farmer now or pay the doctor later and it's going to require people like you, you know, going, let's not go to the cheapest place. Mm. Let's go to the place that has the most ethically sourced and produced produce on their menu and not go as frequently. No, 100%. I mean, Australians have had such a good um, quality and had such a good quantity of food for so long and now it's only getting to the point that we've been in a drought and we've been... Uh, we got problems and it's getting more expensive to um, raise animals and raise vegetables and, and, and raise f fruit. They don't want to pay that extra money because why mm. Why should they? They've been paying such an amazing rate for so long and now it's doubling, tripling in price. They're going to go, why will I, Why should I pay this? Mm. I'll just go to Coles or I'll go to Woolies and I'll pay the same price I've been paying for the past 20 years, yeah. not knowing um, the benefits and, uh, sorry, the disadvantages and the problems you're, you're causing for yourself, eating cheap food, eating processed food, eating um, terrible quality food. And mm. it just goes uh, back to what I was saying about people just aren't educated and it's a shame that they don't want to educate themselves on mm. um, how important it is to eat quality and how important it is to live a healthy lifestyle and be proactive and work out at the gym and um, get out of the house, clean air, you know, um, have a strict routine, not just eat when you want and yeah. You know, like... Um, Where are you getting all your knowledge on what's good for you, good for the environment, good for the animals? Have you got a, a, a trusted source you go to or...? Not really. The way that I sort of um, do it, I guess, is just through everything that I see th through social media, through books, through my dad, through through everything really, through everything these eyes see is what mm. I make my, my opinion on. Yeah. So through exposure, through... Um, what I've been shown, what I've been taught, what I've learned, it, and it's constantly changing. You know, my outlook on life is constantly changing because mm. that's that's how how it is. You know, I see different things every day, and then every day is a different day. That's mm. and and yeah, so that's that's how I form my opinions and 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 and, and yeah. What about the bullshit reader? Is 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 that well tuned? Like, are, are you able to? decipher what's good science from bad or do you get confused by it sometimes i mean of course yeah i mean some you might you you can read something and 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 form an opinion on that because it sounds all good in 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 what it says you know what i mean and mm. that's why a broad re reading is the best and looking at multiple arguments and multiple opinions and going on multiple websites and me reading multiple art uh, articles and listening to multiple people is going to strengthen and you're actually going to you know, form a, a logical and yeah, um, uh, backed up argument. Yeah, I get it. I'm going to put you on the spot in closing, Maxi. I want to hold you to two things. We'll come back and do this again in a year's yeah, time. Yeah, hundred percent. Give me one thing that you can do this year that you believe, and you've got to do it all year, yeah. that will be a step in the right direction for the climate. Um. You know what I'm going to say? And this is going to be very, very hard for me. Mm -hmm. 
I'm going to stop smoking because I think that's a very, very uh, it's a terrible habit. And yeah. Well, I, that's probably for your health. I'm not sure that from a environment, it's probably got some impact on the environment, but I'm, that's an awesome one. Mm. Um, for you, because I was going to ask you that. What's one thing you're going to do this year for your health? That's going to because I imagine there's a bunch of the guys up there smoke. Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's, it's, Marlboro, pretty, it's a tradition man. up there. Man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let's do that. Let's go back to it, and maybe I'll give you a hand with this. Seat. Well, I've I've got one. For you got you. one? Okay, do it. I'm not going to eat any more processed foods. None. No more. Full stop. Wow. No more Maccas. No more KFC. No more nothing. And okay. It's going to be very hard for me. Yeah. And I'm sure. I'm going to have a cheat day every now and then, but I'm really going to try to stick to it because I know how much it damages the environment. Yeah. Um, exactly what you said, intensive farming. I mean, it, it, it's, it's terrible. Like, so the processed foods, I'm going to stop eating. I'm going, to, okay. I'm going to try my hardest to stop eating that. Okay. Stop smoking. Stop eating processed foods. What's one thing you're going to start doing that's going to add value to your life? Um, well, for me at the moment, it's going to the gym and working out. Yeah, is is adding a lot of value, a okay. lot of self esteem, a lot of a lot of everything. I feel good after going to the gym. I feel good after doing a big swim and doing a big run. Like, I, yeah, I think I think a lot more. I think everybody should should be doing at least something, you know, active a day because it just clears up clears up the head, clears up everything. And I mean, mm. it's for the for the better. You're working on yourself. You're getting healthier. You're getting stronger. You're getting yeah, getting everything. Awesome. Thanks for coming on, brother. Thank you for having me.